today to host Seraphine. Um, she is, and she will tell us a little bit more about her. But first of all, I just want to go through, uh, to share with you who she is, what she's about. And you will see that, you know, exactly why we should be absolutely humbled to have her with us here tonight. Uh, Seraphine is a leadership and development practitioner. Uh, who's continuously mesmerized by the power of the human mind. She's an author, she's a columnist, an executive coach, image expert, and successful entrepreneur in advertising. As a founder and lead coach of the Institute of Ultimate Potential, her clients include high-level executive at Barclays Bank, which is the HABSA, CFC Stambic Bank, the World Bank Group, Ecobank Kenya, and South Sudan, Mask, Farway, Truth Children, Authority, and many high net worth corporate and private professionals. Seraphine is a Proctor Gallagher Institute certified expert on leadership development, a professional image consultant educated by the Studio for Image Professionals, and is currently pursuing her practitioner's license in neuro-linguistic programming. She's an established entrepreneur in advertising and industry that she lends her wealth of experience in advertising and brand and corporate communications. Seraphine is the founder and CEO of EG Brownhouse, a respected advertising enterprise, which uh, provides innovative, functional, and distinct brand collateral since the year 2002. The company's client portfolio is a reference for leading brands like IBM, General Electric, Microsoft, Eaton, BAT, GSK, HP, Intel, and so much more. Uh, Stephanie has been working in various capacities in multicultural organizations in the airline, mobile telephony, and advertising industries. She's a board member of the American Chamber of Commerce, uh, that's the Amcham in Kenya. Serafina is married and lives with her husband and three children in Nairobi, Kenya. And Serafina, I also hear you're a delectable and aspiring chef. Uh, so hopefully one day <laughs> you, you'll show us a bit of that side as well. But it's an absolute pleasure to have you. Uh, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to speak. And it's one of the uh, issues that we that has been raised many times within the Africa Leadership um, Women's Group. And, you know, we say, this is what I am, this is what I do. But as, you, as you know, from your perspectives, it's time for us ladies to actually really rethink how we package ourselves, um, you know, from, and from what you sent us, you know, we need to look at the internal perspective. Welcome, Seraphine. And just Thank you so much. Tell, tell us a little bit about you that I didn't say in the introduction. <laughs> A little bit about me that you didn't say in the introduction is that uh, I no longer run EG Brand House and I no longer live in Kenya. I left two years ago. I live in Canada now, but I miss my country. I love my country. I cannot wait to come back, even just for a short visit. Uh, we're going towards the fall. It's already starting to get cold. So yeah. I'm excited to be here, ladies. It's wonderful to be here. It's an honor to be here. And um, let's see what we can talk about today. And I'm excited about this conversation, you know, especially because it has touched me very, very closely. And I was particularly enthused when uh, Diana, who's one of the admins of the group, mentioned, mentioned that this is a conversation that we want to have because a lot of us in the group have situations where they are feeling down for one reason or another. And, you know, if we were, we were alive, if we were in a meeting, uh, in a meeting today, I'd be saying, hey, can I have people who have gone through this? And I'd be seeing hands going up in the air. But COVID has done us a different sort of, uh, deal today, and we are online. So I'm just going to share a few anecdotes with you, and then we're going to take it away from there, all right? So I grew up in a little village in, in Western Kenya, and growing up, we had all these uh, circles where women would come together and go and farm in each other's farms during the high season, during uh, just before the rainy season. And then they'll have parties, and those parties had both men and women talking about the harvest, talking about who did what, and how the next season was going to be. And food would be cooked. Then there would be men sitting under trees, drinking usually uh, from the pot, you know, the alcohol was put in the pot, and every man comes long straw they all put it in there and when food was ready it's the little girls who would be sent to go and tell the men that food was ready and we were not supposed to talk exactly we were supposed to just make eye contact with one of, one of the youngest people in the men's group 
and then whisper to them that the food was ready. In fact, we were supposed to diminish ourselves as we approached this group. What the message was, was that my voice as a young person, as a young female person, wasn't allowed in the presence of other people, in the presence of grown-ups, especially if these grown-ups were men. And I want you to extrapolate that to my life today, where as a, a, a leadership coach, as an entrepreneur, I get paid to speak and to speak loudly. And a lot of my clients are those same men who are mostly older than me, that I was trained not to speak in the presence of. Hold that thought. I'm going to give you another anecdote. I had a near marriage experience. A lot of people have near, near death experiences. I had a near marriage experience and it lasted three weeks. Don't laugh, I know, it lasted three weeks. It was after one year, maybe six months of dating, very tumultuous. Lord helped me understand why I still went ahead with it. I did, I took them out to my village, he paid dowry. Three weeks later, yes, three weeks, not months, not years, three weeks later, I left. I left because the marriage became something that was a mix of all forms of abuse. You think about it, verbal, physical, sexual, just think about it. Now, I'm telling you these stories because I know that a lot of you, my sisters, have been through a lot of similar situations, similar, worse, less than this, that shape the way you think about yourselves. And no matter how strong you are, no matter how tough a personality, a personality you are, anything that you go through in your life will shape how you start to think about yourself. And if those situations that you go through in your life are negative, they will start to shape your self-image negatively. What have you been through? What did you go through as a child? What did your father do? What did your uncle do? What did your mother go through? What did you go through in your adulthood? Which men did you date? Which friends have you had? What kind of situations have you faced in the workforce? How have they shaped how you think about yourself? Because believe me, whatever it is you have been through, it does form how you think about yourself. And that does inform how you conduct yourself, how you present yourself to other people. So if those situations left you feeling small, you behave small. If they left you feeling unworthy, you behave unworthy. If they left you feeling like a fraud, you behave like a fraud. If they left you feeling ugly, you behave ugly. If they left you feeling inexperienced, you behave inexperienced. If they left you feeling half-baked, you behave half-baked. And believe me, whatever it is you behave, the manner in which you behave attracts the kind of response or reactions you get from anybody else. From anybody else. I don't care what you've been through. It does have an effect on how you see yourself, and that has a direct impact on how you conduct yourself, which is how other people end, end up receiving you and treating you. I want you to think about three different scenarios. I took these three different lessons from all these experiences and more that I don't have time to mention because I, I want to respect your time and we're here for a limited time only. I want you to take away three of the lessons that I took away from all the experiences and some of which I have not mentioned, some of them are gory, some of them are sad, some of them are, are funny, some of them today I'm happy that I can laugh about, about them today. But a lot of them have shaped my life in ways that I cannot begin to describe. I was left feeling, um, to begin with, I did. Second, I was left feeling educated enough. I was left feeling unworthy of being in the presence of those who felt they were worthier than I was. I was left feeling that I could only be at certain levels. I was left feeling that uh, I was only a woman and therefore certain things were not for me. I was left feeling that because I didn't grow up with a father, um, it had other connotations about who I was and the kind of people I was dating. Whatever it is you have been through, ladies, I don't care what it is. I don't care how bad it made you feel. I want you to think about how it left you feeling about yourself because this is how you innately believe yourself to be. This is how you, you generally think about yourself, whether or not you're even aware of it. I want you to start being consciously aware of it. And here's what I took away. Three key lessons I took away from my experiences. One, 
not everything you were raised to believe is relevant in your life today. I don't care who raised you, how much respect you had for them. It doesn't matter how much authority they had for you at that moment. Not everything you were raised thinking, believing, and feeling is true. Number two, I want you to know that those who raised you gave you the information they had at that time. They gave you the information they had at that time, and that information was probably valuable but it was for that time. My mother raised me to be the kind of person who cleaned up house and cooked and had everything neat. Trust me, that has not exactly been one of my best achievements today. If you think about it, the amount of time it takes to do all that, the reward is very little. I'm talking to married women right now. The reward is very little compared to how much effort you put in there. And then you start to feel bitter and angry and upset about things. I want you to think about all of this as I think about how you think about yourself. Number three, you alone are responsible for creating your self-image. No matter what else has come before, no matter what other people did, no matter what your experiences, no matter how they left you feeling, you alone is, I'm going to repeat that and I cannot underscore it enough. You alone are responsible for creating your self-image. You want to feel beautiful, you decide that you are beautiful. You want to feel intelligent, you decide that you're intelligent. You want to feel important, you decide that you're going to feel powerful, you decide that you're powerful. You want to feel effective, you decide that you want to feel like you're anything you want to be. It's a decision that you make for yourself. It's a decision that you make for yourself. I want you to think about this. You will take some of what you learned yesterday. As you create that self-image, you will take some of what you learned yesterday. And then it will be based on who you are today. And it will be geared towards the person you want to become tomorrow. As you think about what kind of self-image you will create, I want you to ask yourself five fundamental questions. Bearing in mind all that you've been through, and I understand it can be a lot. As women, the world and the society places a lot of burdens on us. And think about this, we were not there when they were discussing how these responsibilities should be ours. Our opinion was not consulted. We were not at that decision-making table. We were born and we were raised to do certain things grow to a certain age, get married, have children. Those children should be male. They should be smart. You should be a certain kind of person. You should be submissive, subject of everything. And if you're not, you're not a good enough woman. I want you to ask yourself five fundamental questions as you go towards deciding what self-image you are going to carry of yourself and how that affects how you respond and, and behave in any situation that determines how other people treat you how other people respond to you, how other people relate to you, whether or not they respect you, whether or not they treat you right. Five questions. If you have a pen, write it down. First one, why do you see yourself as you do? There's a sudden image you have of yourself. Why do you see yourself as you do? And I'm talking about the negative ones, the ones that don't help you progress towards the things that you want. How do you see yourself? And why do you still see yourself as you do? Number two, who and what gave you that idea of yourself? Who is it who talked and said certain things? What is it that you went through that gave you that idea of yourself? And more importantly, under what circumstances were those things said? Under what circumstances were you going through the things you went through that now form the way you think about yourself? Do those circumstances still apply today? That's number three. Do those circumstances still apply today? Number three. If not, why is it that you still use that lens to see yourself? Why is it that you still use that lens to see yourself? Number three. Uh, Sorry, number five. Who cares? Who cares? The answer is absolutely no one cares. When you come to the world, you come to the business place, you come to the workplace, you go anywhere it is that you want to compete and you want to access 
opportunities like everybody else. No one cares what you went through. They might know about it, they might empathize with them, they might sympathize with you, but at the end of the day, no one cares what you went through. And I'm saying this with all my respect to you. I'm saying this with all the love for all of you, my sisters, as a fellow woman who knows exactly what it means to be a woman in our society, especially in Africa and in society in general. No one cares. For that reason and that reason alone, sister, I want you to wipe those ugly, negative, unproductive feelings about yourself off your mind completely. I want you to gather your wits about you. I want you to know that what you know, what your experience is, many other people don't know it. Many other people don't have it. So I want you to adjust yourself, put on that crown, strut and show yourself to the world the way only you can, no matter where you have been. Terry, I'm ready to go to the next, next session. Wow, Seraphine, uh, that has been so eye so much eye opening, and I was just listening to you, and of course taking my notes as well. Um, <laughs> and and I can see the comments coming in from the ladies. I'll just put them um, some of them so you can read as well. Sure. Okay. And, and there uh, we've got you know somebody who's listening in from the US. Uh, we've okay. got many who are listening from here as well. Uh, okay. There's somebody who said she did French with you, I think, two years ago. Wonderful! <laughs> and she just uh, joined the group. And so many women are saying this is very powerful, um, and they're inviting their other friends as well. I can see that. <laughs> we currently have uh, 954 women who have joined us this evening, which is really, really amazing. So I want to thank everybody who is watching this conversation and being part of this conversation to engage. You know, this is this is the statement. Uh, she's called Sugi, and that she, uh, she, 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 she studied with you. And so ladies, I just want to thank you all so much for making time uh, to be part of this conversation. And you know, in the group, we've raised it time and time again in terms of how do we package ourselves? What are the things we say about ourselves? And uh, just to take us back to what um you know seraphine has has told us how we see ourselves has a direct impact on how we carry ourselves and uh, and i'm just hoping that we will all now begin to send in some questions you have for seraphine so we can uh you know keep it as engaging and as interactive as possible we don't have too much time as we've got about 38 minutes to go um and we want to have the most that we can out of seraphine because even if we had to pay her for this we would not be able to afford it so <laughs> so thank you seraphine and ladies please do start sending in uh your questions so we don't leave you out um and 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 because tonight is one of those nights where i think we can be open it's a safe space it's always been a safe space and I mean, you, you don't have to say what the situation is, but feel free to engage. Seraphine is a coach, she's a leadership coach. So if you have any questions that you can ask around the issue of you know, self-image and just being the best that we are, and it starts with our image, right, Seraphine? It starts with where we are. It starts inside before we reflect anything to the external world, and then the external world only responds to what we put out there. Only response to what we put out there. I see a question here. Am I the only person who can create your, my self image? Yes. Yes. You see, look, other people have all kinds of ideas about who you are. And I'm going to give you a few more anecdotes before I go to the next session. Other people have their own ideas of who you are. And some of these are correct, some of these are, are wrong, but they are based on what you have put forward. And I'm saying that whatever it is you have put forward up until now, will have people think about you in so many different ways. But beyond now, you can decide to become whatever you want to be and create that image and have people respond to that. Will there be people who say, think about you as the previous image that you put in front of them? Yes, and I'm going to give you some anecdotes for shopping. Yes, they will. Then the onus is on you to teach them how you want to treat you by creating a different image. And image uh, is four different conversations that I'm going to get into as soon as I finish this conversation. Image is a whole sentence. It's not one thing. 
but yes, you are responsible for it. It's up to you. You decide. Other people don't think about you as much as you think they do. Believe me. When they do, you can shape how it is that they think about you. You're in full control. Wow. Thank you so much. I'm seeing some questions coming through, but I want us to go back into the um, the second part of, of our conversation uh, this evening, Seraphine. Um, so I'll hand it back over, over to you. Okay, thank you. So, all right. Um, once I lost my job, my first job was at uh, Saudi Arabian Airlines. I lost my job four and a half years into the job. And I think that was one of the best things that happened to me. It's a long story, I'll get into it another time. But the next job I went to look for was a sales job. Okay, it's the first thing that came up. And I went in for the interview. They said to me, um, well, from your resume, you, you don't have a, a, a degree. All our marketing institutes have degrees. And I said, no, I don't. Um, Do you have any sales experience? They asked. I said, no, I don't. But sales is another game. You know, I either deliver the numbers or I don't. And if I don't, you can fire me. They hired me the next day. Now, Fast forward, um, <laughs> I went to work for a different company, okay? I left that company, I went to work for a different company. Now, this company allowed me to stay in Nairobi because the company that I was just spoken about wanted me to go down to Mombasa. That's not what I wanted to do at that moment in time. No offense to my sisters in Mombasa, it's a beautiful place. It's just not where I wanted to be at that time. So I went to work at this company and um, I had to take a different job. I had to take an admin job, but to stay in Nairobi because at that time I was doing my course at Marketing Society of Kenya. So I wanted to stay in Nairobi to finish that. And but I didn't have any marketing uh, background and I was enjoying my work in sales. So I didn't want to leave that to go to Mombasa and I wanted to stay in Nairobi. But the only other job that was available was an admin job. So I took that new job with a very clear understanding. In fact, I was headhunted for this with a very clear understanding that a year later, when I finished my marketing course, I'll be looking for something else. Well, something else came up within the company a year later. It was a plan service job. And when I applied for it, I was told that I couldn't get it. Why? Because I didn't have a university degree. I was upset. I was young. I was sassy. I was um, less, less tactful than I am today. And it showed. I went on the internet and I was looking for jobs at lunch hour, in the evening, I'd stay a little later and look for jobs online. Those days, nobody had computers at home, nobody has internet, I had internet connectivity at home, so it was in the office. So I was looking for a job online. Soon, um, my bad attitude was showing. I was fired from that job a few months later. Okay, let's move forward. But just, I'm telling you these, just keep all these experiences at the back of your mind. Next thing, fast forward, I went to other companies. Um, then I decided to start my own company. That was in the year 2002. When I just started, I think I was one month into it, and I went to an advertising agency that I'd worked at before. And uh, I met the, the managing director who had been my, my boss when I worked for that company uh, previously. And he said to me, oh, Serpin, how is uh, Monier? Monier was a company I worked for as well, just before I started my own company. And I said, oh, I left, I started my own company. He said, oh my God, I wish you had told me before you did that. I said, why? Well, you know, advertising is a very crowded field. Ladies, I moved on to form a company that made 500,000 US dollars a year. I don't tell you this to brag to you because I don't need to. I'm telling you this to help you understand your possibilities in spite of what others think about you. And I want you to understand that image is a conversation that is a four pillar conversation. You talk about image and most people start to think about how you apply lipstick. That's not what image is. This is not image. What you see here, this is my business. Real graphene is the kind of person who is in a t-shirt, in a lesser, in a headscarf, in an apron, in her kitchen to take for her children. This here is my business space. This is not my image. My image is a full sentence, not what I look like at any given time. Not make no mistake, I take care of this. I do everything I need to, to look the part. However, image is not just the way you, because you could look like this, but the rest of it, if it doesn't tally, then the image is not complete. Image is about your appearance. It's about your behavior. It's about your communication. 
and let's include their digital image because we're living in a digital world right now. Let's go into appearance. Does it really matter? Yes. Because unfortunately, people, whether you like it or not, before anybody starts speaking, before you openly want to speak to anybody, everybody has made a mental image of who you are. They have decided to put you in a category, whether you like it or not, whether you're aware of it or not. They see you and they decide who you are. They decide how they're going to treat you based on who they think you are, based on how you look. So the appearance is a very important part of it. We live in a very West Eurocentric world. Whether we like it or not, the workplace as we know it today is Eurocentric. If I had to do this my way as an African woman, I'd be hanging around here with my tits all over the place and a size of scarves, and I'd be very happy. That's how my people dress. It was fantastic. If I did that today and said, look, this is my Afrocentric way of being, wonderful, but it's not acceptable in the workplace today. So what? We are going to merge what we know of ourselves, what we bring to the table as African people, as ethnic people from all over the world, and merge that with the world that we live in today, which is Eurocentric in the workplace, in the business arena, okay? So how you look is dependent upon which industry you work with. There's some industries that are very, very formal. The banking sector, for example, it tends to be on the formal side. So you want to think about what is required of you in that environment. And I want you to think about those requirements as a business outfit you wear for that moment, and it is effective for that moment. It does not define you. How do you, you get it to define you? Then you start to inject a little bit of your Africanness, because we are all African, African women here. You can inject a little bit of your Africanness there, allowing yourself to still feel like you're yourself and not feel like you're straight jacketed into a kind of uniform that is very innocent. I'm saying this because we have a lot of conversations about Black Lives Matter here and everything is about, hey, my identity, my identity. So I'm being very conscious about that. Um, until two years ago, it didn't matter to me. I didn't even know I was a Black woman. I was just an African woman walking around my country. Now, apparently, I am a Black woman and I have to realize, oops, okay, I am Black. Now, as you think about your appearance, because of this Eurocentric life that we live, even in Africa, you want to keep a clean cut look. If you are in the creative arts, for example, if you're in the advertising industry, if you work for an uh, advertising agency, they tend to be very relaxed. In fact, the, the more outrageous you are, the more creative you look, and it's acceptable. But depending on which, which industry you work in, you can have to be very careful about what the other person on the other end of the table expects you to look like. If you went to hospital, and I use this example quite a lot, if you went to hospital, you need brain surgery, and the person who is about to operate on your brain is standing at the corner, he's, uh, he's wearing a t-shirt and a pair of jeans and a baseball hat to complete the outfit, and he's holding a scalpel waiting for you to be prepared. You're thinking, whoa, 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 that's not going to be the person operating on me. In fact, at that point in time, you might feel better. But immediately, okay, because you have some expectations of the kind of person who is a doctor who is about to operate on your brain, because sudden packaging prepares you to either receive things or people positively or not. I the last time I had an office in Nairobi, I had an office in the industrial area, and I saw all these women who were walking around with tea. They would be there from five o'clock in the morning with jerry cans of tea. And they'd be pouring out this tea to the watchmen and the people who came into work early. My, my, my office worked sometimes 24 hours, so I'd be there sometimes very early in the morning. And they'd be pouring this into cups for people. This tea costs 10, 20 shillings. I know because sometimes I'd have to sponsor my people. And, and, and I drank it a few times. It was very good tea. They brewed it and made sure the tea infused very well. It was 10 shillings. And this is a, a cost that people would even begin on. Can you believe that? Now, same people, if you took them to the interval, which is just a few meters away, they'd be served tea, which would be first and foremost tea, black tea on one side, and then milk on one side. And then to have this tea, you'd have to cook it literally. You'd have to make the mix of black tea and then mix the milk tea, which sometimes was cold. Then you put the sugar. By the time you start eat, drinking it, it's no longer the kind of beautiful brew that we used to. They would be paying 600 shillings for that cup of tea. Six, and they would not be bargaining. Why? 
because the appearance of the cup that was served in the appearance of the waitress that was serving, the appearance of the lobby that was sitting in, demands a different kind of respect that will get them paying 600 shillings without butting an eyelid. Yet there were the same people trying to begin with Mama Boga along Baricha Road because she tried essentially for a cup of tea. Think about how image affects everything. This is about appearance, okay? I want you to think about how the image that you put forward affects the other people. Will they be willing to pay 600 shillings for your service? Or will they be bargaining for 10 shillings of your service? You have to think about the industry in which you are in. You have to package yourself according to that industry for you to be bought. If you went to a supermarket and found goods that were in brown envelopes, brown packages, and other, others that were packaged in the colors that appeal to you, you were most likely to buy the ones in the packages that appeal to you. And you might find that what's inside is crap. But because it was packaged and presented in a way that appeals to you, you will buy it first. I'm saying all this bearing in mind that you must have content inside before packaging is done. You must have content inside. Add on packaging, there's nothing you cannot do, sisters. There's literally image opens doors. Make no mistake. The world loves, rewards, and appreciates beautiful things, people, and places. I'm going to repeat that. The world loves, rewards, and appreciates beautiful people, things, and places. The good news is that today, beauty is bought. Just work a little hard. You can buy it. Whatever it is that it means to you, you can buy it. I want you to know that. I don't care if you have pimples like I had growing up from Timbuktu to my pimples look like Ruenzori Mountains. Beauty is bought. There are no ugly women, only lazy ones who don't want to do the work to pack it themselves so that that customer walking around the supermarket will buy them as opposed to the next person. Number two, think about your behavior. Beauty, all this conversation about image is about appearance, behavior, communication, digital image. I call it the ABCD of, of image. Your behavior will determine how people will respond to you, how people will react to you, whether or not they want to be with you, how they feel when they're with you, how they feel improved, improved increased as a result of an encounter with you. The general rules of behavior, general rules of conduct, depending on which industry you are in. How do you conduct yourself? Are you the kind who's going who's to elbow everybody out of this because you think that the only way to get to the top is to elbow Terry out of this, to elbow Diana out of this, to elbow Christine out of this? Look, there is a place of profit for all of us. All of us. You don't need to elbow other people out of the way to get to your place of profit. If you do that, you lose all the people. And when you lose them, you lose their experience, their expertise, and their brains. There's nothing great that has ever been done by one person. I don't care how smart you are. If you're about to do something great, you need people. If you don't behave in a way that helps people understand that they are improved or they are valuable in your presence, they don't want to be next to you. They will not bring the experience to your table. They will not bring the expertise to your table. And you alone will not achieve anything beyond only what you know. Which means you limit your achievement. Watch how you treat other people. Watch how you conduct yourself. One thing I want you to be careful about women, we are all beautiful women and a lot of times we we'll walk down the street and everybody stares, watch the sex. Sisters, watch the sex. You don't eat where you shit. You don't eat where you shit. The workplace is one place where you don't want to start effing around. It doesn't help you because soon enough you find everybody discussing your little bits. They do. They do. Trust me. I work with both men and women and the things I hear as a coach are ridiculous. 
we have to be. And look, I'm not an angel here. I know my name, my name means angel. I'm not an angel here. I've been around the block and back, trust me. But you want to be careful about who you are with. I don't care how beautiful you are. Watch it in the workplace. You want to get to the top? Pull up those panties and close the legs. Open them elsewhere. Open them elsewhere. Trust me with this. People pay dearly, both men and women. This applies to both women, men and women, but mostly for women because usually we are in the lower levels of leadership in the workplaces. And when we get into these situations, what happens is the lower person who suffers. Usually the women are the casualties. Watch it. F elsewhere. Don't check where you eat, ladies. Please don't. Be careful as you go up the ladder. Every time you're going up, be careful. Think about the people you're meeting. Think about the people you're passing because you're going to meet them on the way down. You're going to meet them on the way down. Be careful how you treat them. Behavior, ladies. Are there any comments? Are there any, any questions that I need to Talk about oh, yes. yes, yes, yes. Um, this, this Stella here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Seraphine, for the priceless information. Uh, what tips can you give us on how to build executive presence and the art of broadcasting? Uh, it's, it, I don't know what the I'm not sure I understand that question. The art of broadcasting. I think we can talk about, I guess, the first part on how to build an executive mm -hmm. presence. I think the part of the broadcasting is perhaps a compliment to you and perhaps a <laughs> thank you. Well, how we can also, uh, you know, I guess be eloquent, be out there. Okay. You know, Stella, as I said, um, image is not one thing. It's a combination of appearance, behavior, communication, and digital image. Every time you're thinking about that executive presence, it's all of that. How do you speak? And I was just coming to that, so I might as well get into it. How do you speak? The way you speak determines how other people decide who you are. You can tell the kind of school the person went to by the way they speak. You can tell where they come from by the way they speak. At least in our country, we can. You can tell their mindset by the way they speak. First and foremost is the accent. First and foremost is the second is the mindset. Third is the reference that they will make. How are you communicating? How does that help other people put you in the kind of box you want to be put in? An executive image is about how you want to be seen. An executive is very, very relative, very relative. But if you're talking about the, the standard, formal business look, it's something you can craft still. It's something you can craft. There are certain outfits you want to be aware of, there are certain colors you want to be aware of, there are certain looks you want to be aware of, and they can be Eurocentric, like my hair right now is a bit Eurocentric, I've made sure that I have some waves there to keep it a little bit more on the African side, but it is Eurocentric. At the same time, you can decide to infuse a lot of your African, it's going to have your red, it's going to have anything. Look, it's about proportion, okay, Stella? it's about proportion. Know the rules, I'm sharing with you what the general rules are, so that when you break them, because I know our African sisters are not one who obey all those rules. We have a way of infusing our African message to everything that is only African. Only we can do it. I'm telling you what the rules are, so that when you break them, you break them intelligently. Wear this kind of outfit to work if you want this kind of response. And it's a broad conversation that we don't have enough time for, and I'm happy to get into that with you separately, but it's about what you wear, how you speak at any given time, what kind of job you have, who you are addressing. At the first time I had to talk to these people, I don't know who are Who are you selling yourself to? Executive is very relative, and it's not about what you think most of the time, it's about who you're selling to, and what are they buying? That's what, it, what is executive to them. You have to fashion yourself according to the customer you're selling yourself to. Are there general rules? Yes. Do they apply to all of us? Sometimes. Can we break them? Yes. But once we know what they are, once we know what they are, when you're communicating, Terry, I'm just going to get into communication. 
as you're communicating, how is it that people understand what you're saying? Can they hear you clearly? Do you have mother tongue influence if you do get rid of it? Because it takes you into a certain box that you don't want to be put into because getting out of there is hard. And once they put you there, it limits other possibilities for you. What are the things you're talking about? Not even just an accident. What are the things you're talking about? The things you talk about put you in a certain box of people think a certain way. Who are you speaking with at any given time? Whoever it is you're speaking with, I want you to package your conversation according to them. This is why whenever we apply for jobs, ladies, we change our resumes every so often, isn't it? We're the same person. But if a person is looking for an assistant, I'm going to pack myself up this way. If the person is looking for a CEO, I'm going to pack myself different. If the person is looking for a I'm going to pack myself different. It's the same way you want to package your communication. It's the same way you want to package your business language. When you're speaking with people in a certain industry, you want to learn how to speak. You want to learn their industry language. Because at any given time, guys, life is a game that you must know the rules and play within those rules so that when you break them, you break them intelligently. At any given time, just know the rules of the game. It's nothing complicated. I'm a girl from the village. When you see me in the village, I'm very village. I'll carry a pot over my head. I'll be cooking. I'll have a baby on my back. I'll be putting firewood in there. Then I can come to the city and sit at the high table and eat a very good night. You just have to know who you are. And you know how kind of comedians are? They change their colors. If anyone knows, they, they change their colors. You must be able to change your colors wherever you are. So it's not one straight thing. It's not one simple thing that you're going to say, I'm going to become this person who speaks this certain way all the time. And when you meet other people who don't speak that certain way, you still want to do that. And then you put people off. You start speaking your mother tongue with an accent. You cannot do that. Apply the things you need where they are applicable. Know which, know which environment you are in and package yourself for that environment. Because in any given environment, you're selling yourself. And all the environments around you are interdependent. You sell yourself well in this one, you get a referral for the next one. You sell yourself well, you get a referral for the next one for the next one. Because none of your none of any aspect of your life is independent of the other. If we look at your digital image, at any given time, somebody is consuming who you are online. What image have you put there? What is that picture? Are you showing all the cleavage all over the place? I don't know how people do this online. Maybe you young people can tell me. I get a lot of people sending me their pictures of their pictures of their nether regions, sending me all kinds of really interesting proposals. I'm wondering, what is it I have put there? Even with my very sober images, I still get that. And from the day on, I've decided I want all men off my profiles because they're disrupting my business. Unfortunately, the image you put in front of people in the digital world is one that does not allow you the right of response. They consume who you are digitally. And you don't have an opportunity to say, no, that's not who I am. No, that's what I, not, not what I stand for. No, that's not what I meant. No, that's not what I want. So the digital image has to be exactly how you want to be appreciated. And still with that, you will find all these crazies out there who still send you pictures of their unmentionable. Mm. Are you ranting all over social media about traffic? Are you ranting about your husband? Are you ranting about your boyfriend? As I said, no one cares. Where do you want to go? Where do you want to be? Who do you want to take with you? And how do you want to be remunerated when you get there? That's what your image should be as you appear, as you behave, as you communicate, as the digital image that you put there. Terian, I'm done. Okay. We've got, we've got a question here, um, and I'll just read it. How do we know that what we want isn't as a result of conditioning, uh, societal or parental or religious, if you see? How can we unlearn things that may be tied to our false beliefs? It seems hard to create your own self-image unless you are deliberately objective about yourself and forget yourself for a moment and see yourself in the third person. 
Oh, I love that person. Who is who's asked that question? I love that person. Please tell me the name. I, 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 I can't see her name, unfortunately. Oh my God. Yeah. Please don't. Even, I love that question. You know, people. We are raised by people who I'm sure had their best, our best interests at heart. I am sure they did. Please trust me, okay? And even when they didn't, they thought that what they were doing was, was the right thing at that moment in time. But at, at a certain point, you become of age. You reach the age of reason, and you have to decide for yourself which of these things that you were taught are still applicable. I told you about the five fundamental questions. I'm sorry, and I'm going to share this with you so you can share it to the group for those who, for the benefit of those who are out here. You have to ask yourself those five fundamental questions. The things you were taught and the way in which you were raised, are they still applicable for your life today? If they're not, why are you still carrying on with them? I was taught that I'm left-handed and therefore that's going to be a bad thing because when I get married, my husband will not have a separate home for me and I'll forever be doomed to live in my mother-in-law's home and I'll forever be her mate. That's not applicable anymore. Left-handedness is a great thing. I love that I'm a very creative person because I'm left-handed. It was a handicap when I was growing up. I was beaten a hundred times to use my right hand. Think about all those things you were taught. And please, I know that this requires that you're going to question the people who are in authority in your life. It could be your mother. It will be your father. It will be your elder sisters who we respect. It will be people who raised you, people who took care of you when you couldn't, and people you are still grateful for to date. But as you chat your way forward, you have to understand that what they gave you was theirs, their understanding of life as it was at that time, for that time. What do you want for yourself now? Where are you going with your life tomorrow? Are those notions of who you are and what you should do and who you do it, you should do it with still applicable for who you are, where you're going? and what you want to achieve tomorrow. If they're not, I want to ask you to put them aside and bring in new ones that serve you for the things you want to do, for the person you want to become, for where you want to go. It requires you sometimes to seem, I know it feels you a little bit disrespectful, but they could not have praised you for the life that you did today because they could not have known. If I took the lessons I was told, especially about speaking, I should not speak. Little girls don't speak too loudly, my mother said. Mm. Hey, shut up. Akelo, shut up. My name is Akelo. Akelo, shut up. You have to keep quiet, you child. Today, I get paid not to keep quiet. <laughs> I mean, just think about that. I respect my late mother. I do. There's no single day that I don't think about her. There's no single day that I don't hear her voice in my own voice as I speak to my children. Mm -hmm. Trust me, there's no single day that I don't feel so homesick when I talk. Right now, I'm about to tear up as I think about it. I love that woman. I wish she was in my life today. Trust me, there's so many things about her that if I could just say to her today, Mama, you said this, and I see this in my life today. You said this about children. Oh, my God, I wish I could tell you this. You said this about men. Oh, Christ, if I could just talk to you. You know, I wish, and I, it, look, questioning the things she told me has nothing to do with disrespecting her. But her time was a different time. And guess what? She taught me what her mother taught her. And her mother taught her what her mother's mother taught her. And her mother... The line goes long. Sisters, the line goes long. Yeah. If we applied all those things today, we would be trying to live like our grandmothers in this century. We'd be bringing our grandmothers to lead, lead our lives today. It doesn't work. They were wonderful people. They raised us, and a lot of what they taught us, we will carry to our graves and we will still teach to our daughters. But it is no longer applicable in so many ways because my mother would not have known that I would be this businesswoman in a cosmopolitan world. She would not have known that I'd be living on the other end of the world from the village she raised me. She could not possibly have taught me the skills I needed to use here today. Some of what she taught me is applicable, but a lot of it is not. As I leave it behind, it doesn't mean disrespect. It just means, Mama, I love you. 
mama. I respect you, mama. Thank you for teaching me at that time. But I have to put this aside with lots of love and I miss you so much. But my life right now involves being a leader in a world that I am competing in with those men, those same men that you told me I should not speak in front of. Now I need to speak louder than them to be successful sometimes. Now I need to speak in front of them to be successful. Now I need to speak looking them directly in the eye, even though you told me that was a disrespectful thing for a little girl to do. Now I have to do that or they will think, I don't know what I'm talking about. And they will use it against me. And I would lose money and your grandchildren would go hungry. Uh, Seraphine, absolutely, and in such in and in such a powerful way as well. And I see we're quickly running out of time, but there is there is a question, a, a couple of questions that I would like to combine sure. about positioning yourself strategically within the office space. Um, you know, with office politics con combined, I saw somebody talk about witch hunting. Uh, just positioning yourself for uh, executive uh, positions. So perhaps you can just uh, not wrap with that, but answer that. And then I'd like to give you some time to just some final comments um, and remind up. But first of all, just respond to how you position yourself within an office space, uh, keeping in mind office politics, you're a woman. And there was a question as well about, uh, you know, being Eurocentric. You, do you have to wear makeup to have a good image? Somebody actually asked that as well. So maybe you can combine those uh, before you can have some final statements. <laughs> okay, very, very good question. Sarah. Now, I'll start with makeup. Because mine is all over your face right now. Number two. Um, the office politics. Okay, what was number three? If I um, so there was the office politics and positioning positioning yourself uh, for executive roles within the in the office space. Great. Okay, I'll start with makeup, ladies. As I said, we live in a very Eurocentric world today. Wherever you go, there's a sudden expectation that has been brought on by the Western world, by the Western culture. This is Western culture. Unfortunately, even you and I, much as we love our Africanness and we love nature and we love who we are and we know we are beautiful as we are, it does help. This, this is a business outfit. The same way you need education, you need makeup. Even if you want to keep it very natural, you don't have to wear bright red lipstick like Serafine. You don't have to. If you do, you're saying to somebody, look, I'm those kind of women you don't play around with. Sometimes it can be intimidating, but you want to just have that face cleanly taken care of. Look, nature is overrated. I'll be honest with you. Nature is overrated. There's all good things about nature, but at the same time, we need help. If you go to a hospital to give birth, as opposed to give birth in the house that my mother gave birth in, it tells you that nature is overrated. We are living in a different world today. Our bodies, our health, our image, our businesses, is, is the world has changed. You can fight it all you want, or you can get to the program and be in the position to win in the new world. This is the new world. I want to put it so many different ways, but that is the bottom line. Women who take care of themselves this certain way get paid more statistics. They get paid more. Fewer people will begin on their fees. I'm telling you. In the workplace, they're recognized more. They're the ones who get to go and represent companies in the places that matter. Committees that are put together, organizations coming together for one thing or another, they're the ones who get to go there because they present the preferred image of most companies. You know what happens when that when they're sent there? They get opportunities because they get to rub shoulders with the people who make decisions at other tables. They're the ones who move from company to company, and each time they move, they rise up in the corporate ladder. It does make a difference in how you're perceived. 
it means you have assimilated. It means that you understand the language of business. Makeup is not necessarily about beauty. It is the language of business. Same way education is. You have a degree, you get farther. If you're smart and use it wisely. You have another degree, you get even farther. You have a third one, you get even farther. Do you have to have one to, to make it a, a success? No. I was making lots of money in my company. I didn't have a single degree. I don't have a single one. So do you have to have it to, to be successful? No. But it will increase your chances. It will greatly increase your chances. Whatever you think about it, think about it as part of your business record. It's the outfit you wear to go to work. Use it. It takes nothing out of you. Believe me, you might even start to like it. I started to wear makeup mainly because I had so much acne, I was using it as something to hide my marks. So makeup is different things for different people. But it helps. Trust me, it does. Every time I work with people and I make sure that they start to change that, they start rising up. And it's not one thing. Because when I work with people, I don't only teach them how to wear lipstick. Because I don't teach them how to wear lipstick. I send them to somebody else. But when you combine their appearance and you combine the behavior, you combine their thinking, you combine their communication, all that adds up to a very powerful individual who already knows how to work in certain organization. Usually they've been there for three, four, five years and they're not moving anywhere. Suddenly things start to happen. In fact, as I've said this, I'm going to start posting the various uh, testimonials I've had from my clients. Things start to happen. This, is, I mean, this has changed. This person changed. No, that person didn't change. You changed. The world doesn't change for you. Get over yourself. The world doesn't change for you. When you change, the world changes its response to you. The world is just the world. It makes a difference. Office politics. Every time you're in any environment, there will be those who will be above you, there will be those who will be at the same level, there will be those who will be um, beneath you. You want to think about this very strategically. You want to be an influencer within the people you are at the same level. At the same time, you want to keep your pulse on the on, on, on your finger on the pulse of those who are under you because they have recommendations and sometimes they have the ear of the person who makes the decision about where your career goes or doesn't. But make no mistake, wherever it is you work, if the people who matter, if the people who make the decisions about how the company goes, where it goes, and who it takes with it, if they don't know your name, you're not going anywhere. If they don't know how you contribute, you're not going anywhere. If they don't know that you do things a certain way, you're not going anywhere. I'm saying, ladies, promote yourselves. In the workplace, whatever it is you do, if nobody knows that you did it, somebody else takes the credit. And there's no shortage of people who do that. You know that. And most of them are not, are not female. They're usually male. They have no qualms about taking credit about your work. And a lot of us women have been raised to be humble. We've been raised to sit in the background. We've been raised to be kind. Nonsense. I tell all my clients to read a book. There's a book called Nice Girls Don't Get the Corner Office. Buy it. Read it. Now. Nice girls don't get the corner office. You want to do things, but you also want to make sure that it is known that you've done. It is known by the people who matter that you've done. Frequently. All those networking events, all those cocktails in the evening that you skip because you're running home to kids, and I'm not saying don't love your kids. Love your kids, love your husband as much as you want. But there's no day that your husband and your kids are going to say, darling, mommy, you've done so much work for us at the house. Please just sit back and go for all the networking events. We'll take care of, this, of ourselves. They're not going to do that. You have to carve out time out of your other obligation status because your competitors who are men are out there promoting themselves while you're busy for speeding. I'm telling you. I'm telling you this. And I'm not being condescending. When I had my first child, I took three months off. I had just started my business. I took three months maternity off. And I had my child in April. By the time I went back in June, I literally had no business. People have moved on. I was busy breastfeeding my child at home. 
life moved on. My clients found other people who were available. They were not pregnant and breastfeeding their children. The time I had my second child, I had my second child in, um, in October. It's high season in advertising. I had that child on a Saturday. In fact, I used that child at 37 weeks. I had no time to stay pregnant. 37 weeks. I had the child on a Saturday. After inducing myself at home, by the time I went to hospital, I was four centimeters dilated. The, doc the doctor wasn't going to send me back home. Had that child, one hour labor, done. Monday, I was back home. Thursday, I was in the office. The baby was in a faucet basket. When it cried, I breastfed, I answered calls, I sent samples to class, I talked to them. At those days, we didn't have very expensive to have internet connectivity at home. I mean, it was just a nightmare. I carried that child to my office for the first month. For the first month. Nobody cares that you have a family. One of the fundamental questions I ask you ask yourself, who do you think cares? The answer is absolutely nobody. In fact, I'm going to put it this differently. Absolutely nobody cares that you have other wifely duties, other motherly duties at home. Be at those networking events. That is where decisions are made. That is where relationships are crafted. That is where rapport is built. That is where you sell yourself as a person. Will people hit on you? Yes, they will. Because you're female, most men think that it is their God-given right to hit on any woman that passes their face. Please, you have to be able to counter that. You look, most business places are full of men. Get used to it. You have to be the kind of woman who understands exactly what they're in business for. If it is a sex, you have a lot of it. Believe me, any woman will attract the sex in the office area. Any. You have to decide which of it. <laughs> that killed me. Don't be timid, humble nonsense. Don't kill <laughs> That's interesting. Look, wherever you go, you will have sexual advances, especially if you're beautiful. And I'm saying you must be beautiful because it will open doors for you. Trust me, it will open lots of doors for you. Once you get in that door, you decide what you do in there. If you build your, 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 your confidence well enough, you're able to counter all those nonsensical attractions by being extremely tactical. I joined a board because of my mouth. I yapped too much. And one time I, 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 I criticized a board, a, a group of people. And they said to me, oh, why don't you come and help us do it? Before I knew it, I was recruited into a board. And I went there, and trust me, the way I was recruited, I didn't understand that other people had not been told. So by the time I got onto this board, the person who got me on was a male person. And the rest, a lot of the rest of them were male. There was only one other meeting. I got into this board, and people started to look at me funny. I quickly realized that they looked at me, and they looked at the person who got me on the board, who was the president of the board at that time, and they thought, oh, he brought one of his bitches around. Oops. Okay, it was time for action. I decided, okay, game on. I called each and every one of the CEOs, and they were CEOs of major companies. I called each and every one of them. I bought lunches, I bought breakfasts, and talked to them about me, myself, who I am, what I'm doing here, why I need their support. Each and every one of them, because there was the assumption. Look, it doesn't matter what people think about you. I'm not going to be able to shape everything that people think about you, but you want to be able to manage it. I couldn't have people thinking, I am here. I am a beautiful woman. I know that. I don't think it's a curse. We're told beauty is a curse. No. For me, beauty is a gift that I will always be grateful to my parents for. These are good genes, and I will use them for as long as I can. But I also call to be responsible. I'm also going to be responsible to myself because it, it's a double-edged sword. It can open doors for you, but it can also open sheets for you. You get into those sheets, into those beds, you're in trouble all the time. I'm telling you. So you have to decide for yourself where you want to take this beauty, where you want to take this good looks, where you want to take this brain, and where you want to take this mouth if you have a mouth like surgery. Mm -hmm. Let it open doors for you. They will hit on you as you go for those networking events. But it is a place where you sell yourself. Let them be hitting on you. People being hit on is not the worst thing that can happen to you. Sleeping around is the worst thing that can happen to you. But that you have full control of. When they hit on you, give them hope. Don't be that village girl. I was talking to the man. 
hits on you. The first thing you do is abuse him, insult him. In fact, include his father in the insult. Don't do that in the workplace. The workplace is full of men. You need them. You need them. However, women, however liberated you want to be as women, you need those men because they open a lot of doors that fellow women are not at. And if those fellow women are there, they may not open those doors for you. You need those men. Give them hope. One time the Pope of the Catholic Church, I'm Catholic, the Pope of the Catholic Church came to Kenya a long time ago. And one of my friends, one day as I was coaching, he said to me, you know, you Catholic, what happened? You know, one time the Pope came here and it was such a whole conversation. And when he was asked what he was brought, what he was bringing to Kenya, he said, I bring them hope. I bring them hope. Flocks of people were in Hurupak. People traveled from all over the country. People were sleeping in lodges, sharing rooms. They came to see the Pope at Uhurupak. Why? Because he brought them, he brought them hope. Ladies, give them hope and keep them hope. Yeah. Wow. Seraphine. So uh, we <laughs> right now have about 10 minutes now. But we'd really love to have you again. I've seen so many ladies asking, when is she coming back? So I'll be back um, to you on email and on your WhatsApp. This, hopefully you'll find some time to come and talk to, to these incredible ladies again. They love you so much. Um, as you can see from the comments, uh, we've had about 1,800 women done this this evening, the part of this conversation. And so as we wind up, Seraphine, your final comments, uh, just throw some challenges at us. I see many ladies saying, I'm going to change my image. I'm going to, you know, learn ABC. I'm going to do makeup now. You know, so there's clearly a lot that you have said that has really touched a row now for many of us who just needed that push. And I can see one of the admins saying, I needed to hear it in Seraphine's voice. <laughs> you know, it's, it's that thing of you just need sometimes an extra push and that's what you have done for many, many of us this evening. So Seraphine, as we wind up your final comments and then we'll say Asante to you and wish you a good day. I know it's, it's what time is it uh, in Canada now? It's 2.10. It's 2 in the afternoon. Okay. So, so just, you know, give us some uh, closing remarks and then we'll wind up. So over to you, Seraphine. So, I can come back as many times as you invite me. I am busy, but I will make time for my sisters, my African sisters, especially being in a place where I don't meet that many African people. It can be very lonely, so it's wonderful to be here. Even if it's, it's virtual, it's wonderful to be here. Um, yeah. People, as you ask, okay, what more? We are talking at a very interesting time. I've just launched a program, and Terian, please allow me to advertise uh, uh, this. Hey, hey, ladies, I've just said to you, look, open opportunities. I'm starting a program on Saturday. It's a full program. These are the conversations I'm having. I'm helping people go from stagnant to brilliant. Six lessons, six Saturdays, 12 lessons. Six sessions, six Saturdays, 12 lessons. It's 295, 297 per person. Right now, it's 197 per person. There's a sudden click in my group that I've given an extra 30% of that makes it 167 per person. If I were you, I'm giving it to you right now. If you're online right now, you want to run more therapy, you want to hear from me, you want to learn from me, you want to work with me closer, get onto this. I'll send you the link to get the, the separate rate of 167, which I've extended to only 12 people in my group. Get on board. I'll see you on Sunday, okay? I'll send the link to Terry and she can share that with you. Final words. People, nobody knows where you come from. Nobody cares what you went through. Nobody is interested in all that. People are just interested in what's in it for them. Everybody you come across at any moment in time wants something out of it. You, as you engage with anybody in your life. You want something out of them. Determine what it is you want out of people and be clear about what it is you're offering other people at any given time. Whatever it is you're opening, offering, package yourself according to what it is you're offering so that they buy. So that they buy at any given time you're selling yourself. Are you packaging? It may be product, it may be service. Are you packaged? If you're not 
They are going to pass. They are going to, if they're online, they're going to swipe left. If they're in a store, they're going to move on to the next shop. Trust me. Package yourself from the inside out. Whatever you think about yourself, no one knows until you let them know with the, by the way you conduct yourself. What are you letting them know? Make sure you let them know the thing that you want to be known as, the person that you want to be perceived as, and the way in which you want to be treated. Most importantly, the way in which you want to be treated. You determine how other people respond to you. You determine that. Even as I put for, as I said, I put forward my, my problem, and I get all these ridiculous responses from men. That's what they see. Even as you do that, you find that there will be still people who see, see you in totally different ways. Swipe right, cut them off, and leave your area, leave your surrounding area only with the energy that you want in your life so that you are left without distractions and you can focus towards your goal. That's it. Thank you. Wow. That is such a beautiful high, therapy that you, uh, you've left us in. Thank you so, so much for making time to be with us this evening. And thank you for accepting our request to come back again. So I will be in touch with you just to find out uh, when. Uh, this Lucy was asking, how do we get to work with her privately as a coach? Um, perhaps you can respond to that. Before, uh, find, find, find me online.